Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're on another episode of Beat and Ask with Dr. Wealth. I'm Elvin, I'm your host, and today I have Geraldine with me. He, uh, she is a very uh, popular blogger, right? She writes a lot about uh, millennial stuff, career advice, personal finance, as well as a lot of social issues in Singapore. So I'm uh, happy to have a very young guest today. I, I, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm, I don't call myself really a millennial. I'm more like a Xenio in between the Gen, uh, uh, Gen uh, X, sorry, Gen X and uh millennials right so i'm like that transition the loss in transition so it's good to hear uh really for millennials uh what their challenges are and what their dreams and hopes are right so uh, we i also have this uh tendency to know that uh you know a lot of the seniors the senior generation i right, always look look at the younger generation and say oh you're so pampered you know you have this i don't have that when i was in my generation you grew up with this uh, you know you should not complain on a lot of things right uh, but i guess the context are very different okay so uh, maybe we can start off with uh, uh, you sharing right uh, what do you think are the main challenges of millennials in singapore today all right so thank you, Alvin, for your question. Yeah. So first of all, um, yes, like you, I also hear a lot of the comments you know, from the older generation criticizing the younger generation and you know calling us like strawberry generation, you know, saying things like we are entitled and all that. Hopefully, this COVID nineteen situation you know, and the things that all of us are going through together would help to adjust the conversation. Because after all, the millennials, while we have don't face the exact same challenges as the generation before, we do have our own set of challenges, which I wouldn't say are much easier to deal with as well. So maybe let's dive a little bit deeper into some of the kind of um, concerns that millennials are facing. Uh, first of all, I guess, you know, um, one of the key issues um, that many people have raised is actually the cost of living. Uh. So if you were to look at the prices right. of like, weddings, you know, the prices of um, HDB flats in Singapore, they've all increased um, at a much faster rate than that of uh, starting salaries. So just to give you an uh, example, so, you know, I actually compared my starting salary with my friend who is about 10 years um, my senior and graduated around 10 years um, before me. And I realized that we actually had the exact same starting salary um, okay. when we graduated. Yeah. Actually, but is it in the same field? Is it in the same field? love you both in PMET uh, but I would say that his role is slightly more technical than, than mine but even okay. so to have the exact same <laughs> starting salary which is uh, 2008 by the way um, it's kind of um, co concerning uh, in, in my yeah yeah view. considering and the inflation and for the last 10 years also slightly different maybe in two ways right so if you think about the 1990s you know 1980s um, um when you graduated you kind of they just compete with singaporeans however um, because of our open labor market policy uh, what happens for my generation is when we graduate we, comp we are competing like globally with you know a lot more um people from different countries as well so the kind of um, competition has gotten stiffer so so i would say this is like the second uh challenge that uh, we are facing and thirdly would be that of technological change or so because it's it's not really our education system's fault per se but kind of like the world outside the education system has kind of evolved a lot more quickly so what we learn in school would be very different from what is expected from us you know in the labor market for instance uh, when i was still in school you know, i graduated in 2014 we were learning like four p's for marketing you know product promotion or something you know the four p's right but then yeah. when i graduated the employers were looking for different skill sets like you know sem social media marketing you know how to do um how to use marketing automation softwares and all that so the kind of like gap was um there between what the market expected of us and what we were taught in school so so i guess this kind of summarizes the different set of challenges that uh, millennials have to deal with uh, so i do hope that the older generation watching this would kind of realize that you know it's um maybe not the right thing to be 
um, ages, uh, you know, ageism actually cuts both ways and, you know, it's all about, like, being able to understand each other and helping each other to kind of, like, um, advance in, in, and progress in society um, as a team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I guess definitely agree uh, because um, uh, it's very easy to, uh, even sometimes I, I caught myself, like, in this kind of situation where uh, when I look at my kids and I say, wow, you know, when I was young, I don't have this, you know, but, you know, it, it's, it's a very natural reaction, but, um, we are not in their shoes. We don't know really how, uh, what their challenges are and how they are really dealing with it. Lah. So hearing from you, um, it seems like uh, globalization uh, is one of the key issues and the world has really moved, right? Uh, Technology-wise and millennials have, be, have to be a lot faster to adapt uh, to this uh, uh, fast-changing world compared to maybe the previous generation, right? We are still pretty much protected. Uh, Singaporeans get Singapore uh, jobs, right? But now uh, is no longer that case. Uh, you're not just competing in your own class, but you're competing with everybody in the rest of the world. So uh, uh, it's, it's really a different kind of level of challenges, right? Uh, so for those who are tuning in, if you are, if you are a millennial, okay, uh, it would be good if you can voice out some of the challenges that you face and uh, we can we can address them. We can get Geraldine to address them. All right. Um, and let's talk about something more positive. Okay. Despite all these challenges that you have mentioned, uh, what are some of the hopes and dreams of this millennial generation? Mm, all right. So the question is about you know what are the kind of aspirations that um, our generation has? Correct. Yeah. Hopes and dreams. So for our generation, I think, um, you know, the kind of hopes and dreams are not completely different from the generation before. I do get with me that, you know, of course, they love to have their home, they would love to start a family, and this is the one dream that they have I do actually it extends beyond um the hopes of millennials actually extend beyond you know what we called the five C's last time. You know, last time the, yeah. the older generation would crave for what country club membership, condo car and all that kind of thing. Our yeah. experience I, I don't think we even like country club different. anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> correct, correct. Um the focus is really a lot on more about like okay. Um, two things, right? How do we make more out of our life? Like, um, you know, being able to travel and see the world. And at the same time, I also noticed that, you know, many of my peers are very, very uh, focused on, you know, how can they actually give back to society? You know, certain causes like inequality, um, environmentalism, um, you know, taking a, taking a stance against sexual harassment. These are causes that many millennials stand for and hope to do their small part and, you know, take action towards um, resolving these kind of problems in society as well. So that's very, a very encouraging trend that I see from uh, millennials. So, you know, to summarize, right, of course, we also hope to have home ownership. We hope to have, you know, financial security and to start a family and everything. But I guess that for many of us, this um, ambition for extends beyond just our own personal lives to the entire society as well. Like how can we actually make it better? How can we learn more about this world? You know, yeah. Okay, so it's almost. Uh, it seems like it's the Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? That um, probably the previous generation has done a very good job in uh, preparing for the next generation to really uh, propel to the top of the pyramid to to that self actualization stage where people talk about ideals, what do you stand for, and things like this. Right, because if let's say we don't have uh, food, water, security, probably we will be worrying about that, right? That will be what we are uh, going to strive for. But I guess um, uh, that is the good thing that uh, the generations that advance, right? Such that millennials can can do a lot more in this area. Do you agree that uh, it's more like this that we're building on the success of our previous generation, or millennials are just exposed to you know what what caused the millennials to have? Uh, more ideals or they are more they are pursuing more of these uh, uh, campaigns or whatever yeah okay I think uh, I, I, I will not I will not um, I will take this chance to kind of also express my gratitude uh, towards the pioneer generation and Meneka generation because after all it's because of their efforts uh, collective efforts you know and contribution to Singapore in their various ways that 
help us to create like a good country that we we have today. And um, I think millennials are really um, born in this kind of um, environment where we can enjoy some of these fruits of their labor. So very a very big thank you to all the uh, pioneer generation and uh, Medica generation who are actually listening to this um, Facebook Live. Uh, so that's one reason, of course, you know, being able to work with, um, you know, build upon like um, what the previous generation has and then aspire to a higher level along the you know, master hierarchy of needs. However, um, I think that there are other factors that also contribute to this trend. Uh, for instance, social media is one of them, right? Uh, it's because of, you know, I guess over time society becomes more open and social media also helps to accelerate that because right now everybody can be that way. Um, own their own media, they can just and share their experiences without, um, you know, too much censorship or anything. So uh, I do see many young adults coming off, coming out to express their, you know, concerns around topics like maybe discrimination because of their skin color, or maybe perhaps um, uh, discrimination because of their gender or sexual harassment uh, issues, which actually creates more awareness about this topic and garners the support of, you know. Uh, other millennials to rally behind them and to you know help them to fight for their cause together. So I guess it's it's really a multitude of uh, factors that they are mm. working together okay. to create strength. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned that social media creates a platform for people to be more vocal about it, right? To mm -hmm. to really state their stand, and maybe the environment is a lot friendlier for people to say something without. Uh, you know the the fear that you know you're gonna come and censor me that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So yeah. uh. Uh, for oh you know maybe our previous generation also stood for something just that they don't have the platform to to really oh. amplify their views right yeah. it could be that case right maybe that has always been inborn with in us yeah. yeah just that millennials had this uh, opportunity to do so okay so um of course you know at the end of the day uh every generation their hopes and dreams but they are also uh, plans to how to achieve them correct and you also mm. mentioned the challenges one of them is uh, living costs and things like this right so how can a millennial uh, uh, handle finances in order to realize their hopes and dreams right that is the more practical part yeah okay <laughs> yeah, so okay, now that we've already talked about the challenges, I think we can go to discussing a little more about individuals to do personal improve personal finance. So, so there's a couple of things that personal finance in four categories a man has to focus on, or maybe anyone has to focus on. Uh, first, which is income, insurance. So, um, based on using this framework, of course, we have to think, um, you know, typically just try to not overspend. Uh, what I to really do is having two separate accounts. So, let's say, for instance, uh, every month my salary is being deposited into okay. uh, Sorry, Geraldine, you're breaking up a little bit. I can't really catch you at some parts of the conversation. Uh, so I can and, and this method is actually self uh, which I use I found I just save money. Of course, savings is not the way, right? I, I think it's very, very important for us to invest because um, the whole idea is that if you just leave your money in a bank, probably inflation may, may overtake the amount, the growth that your money has. So in a sense, you're actually losing up. So it's really important for millennials to also start um, investing and learning about um, the various investment options that are available and you know which one is actually best suited for them as well. Um, of course, insurance is you know, basic stuff. Protect yourself with the correct insurance and then do your due, due diligence before buying so that you don't end up overpaying for a plan that you might not need. And the last portion will actually be on income. So income is very rarely discussed um online and i think it's because uh, perhaps maybe topics like salary could still be somewhat sensitive um in our society for now although i do see uh some form of uh, liberalization around this uh, topic people begin becoming more open to, to discuss it um but if you think about it in the early stages right of someone's career um you know, income is the one that actually contributes the, the the most to their like wealth right for a typical person 
And I, I don't believe, Alvin, you've also covered this before in your blog. Like, it's so much easier to increase your income by, say, um, you know, 10%, right? Versus, you know, incre increasing your sa savings by 10% because there's only so much you can actually cut it by as well. And, of course, investing itself also it takes some time to, to learn for you to actually reach a certain level. So, so I do hope that in this um, process of, you know, building up one's personal finance, you know, none of these four pillars are actually neglected or less discussed as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, income is always like the first thing on uh, millennials' mind, right? Because that's the mm -hmm. most immediate thing that they can uh, get rewarded. Because at the end of the day, investment, you also need to have uh, capital. Capital yeah. usually comes from income. Uh, savings, you also need to come from income, right? Mm -hmm. I, I guess the, the cross of the issue is um, uh, how to people, how, how the millennials raise their income, especially you mentioned that 10 years ago, um, uh, your senior start off with the same amount of salary as you, right? Yeah. So, which means that there, there is some, uh, the, the salary is like sort of like stagnant across the generation. Uh, what are mm -hmm. some of the ways that millennials can increase their market value you know, or increase their salaries? Mm, there's quite a lot of things that a millennial can do to actually improve their, I would say, market rate la, in terms of the, in the job market. Mm. Um, of course, all this boils down to certain choices you make. So first of all, I think it's really important to to join a you know a high growth industry or a high growth uh, company. So some of the examples of um, growth areas would be you know for example e-commerce, online learning, ad tech fintech and all that these are the kind of growth industries that you know because they are growing so fast um typically what happens in the labor side is that demand for labor outstrips supply hence they are actually willing to pay more for talent compared to other industries or so um secondly, i think it's also really really important to kind of uh, build up the skill set so let's say for instance you are interested in building a career in marketing then of course you need to build that kind of hard skills, right? In um, mm. you know, the, uh, how how is it like to do to use certain marketing automation softwares? Uh, how do you run ads on Google, Facebook, Link, uh, LinkedIn, and all that? And you know, other kind of skills like maybe content generation and all. So building up valuable skills is really um, uh, something that millennials could look into because very often um, employers cannot find people with this skill set, so they are very willing to pay slightly more for for these roles compared to you know, other roles, which skills may be more common as well. Uh, and the third thing I think is really um, network because uh, you know in school, we, we operate on a 100% meritocratic um, uh, way of doing things, right? Let's say you get a certain result, then you move on to the next stage. But in the working world, of course, merit is important, but sometimes also uh, getting to know people and you know get referrals and things like that are very important. So I do encourage millennials to also use this um, time in their youth when they are free from you know certain kind of family obligations and all that to expand their network to get to know more people and to you know because all these networks are really useful not just in terms of um, job referrals but also finding out things like you know what's the market rate for certain roles or insider information about certain companies and um you know maybe things that would not be found online uh, that network actually share with you as well okay, okay. the three key things i would like to highlight when it comes to you know to improve your um salary every month yeah that, that's that's interesting right especially the last one because uh, it's not so by the book anymore uh, but singaporeans tend to be very bad at that and uh, many are probably very shy you know i i never it's not my thing you know i can't i can't like talk to strangers uh yeah. if let's say someone that's like very introverted how can they overcome this right are there are there like more uh friendlier uh, places to network or some ideas or some tips that they can start off without scaring themselves too much Okay, so I, I did a, a, a webinar on networking recently and someone also asked this question like, oh, I'm very shy. Yeah. You know, what can I do to, to open up? Then I just joke with him, uh, drink alcohol. <laughs> That's my answer for him. <laughs> okay, but it's just a joke, okay? I mean, of course, for some people it helps, so you can, you can do that. Um, but for, for, for myself, I feel that, you know, of course, I'm also slightly towards the introvert side as well. So what I've done is actually try to do more one-to-one -one networking. So let's say, for mm -hmm. instance, I, I want to um, know someone, then I'll write to that person directly. 
and then I would just very humbly uh, share about like you know what I'm actually uh, looking to to learn from them and this is what I can do for them in return it's just like buying them lunch or or coffee and all same way I reach out to you Elvin I reach out to you this way what like through a LinkedIn yeah, yeah. message right just just approach you know the person and then just say like oh I want to you know I would love to actually um, meet up with you to learn more and all that is this kind of one-to-one -one approach that is less intimidating uh, because i do mm. understand that for a traditional networking whereby everyone is like in the same um a lot of people in the room then for introverts we may feel a bit awkward uh, to kind of um, engage with uh engage with people so yeah this will yeah. be my main okay. advice uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's can be quite intimidating but i take a point uh one-on-one -on -one meetings will be less a lot less scarier and mm -hmm. uh you can ask a lot more questions about the person right yeah uh, I, I do hear of there are some people right with networking goals that sounds like this that they they want to meet someone they've never met before every week yeah so oh. which means they set like a target of 52 people in a year right so i i think uh, this uh, setting these kind of goals or what can maybe force that person to do something out of their comfort zone right that oh yeah. i know there's a target i need to do and what's so scary just meet one person that i've never met before what's so difficult right so right. um I, I guess i guess your point about one-on-one -on -one is a is a is a very good one mm -hmm. okay and earlier you also mentioned about like uh, joining fast growth uh, kind of companies that will accelerate your market value your salaries etc um and you also talk about skills right uh, upgrading the skills that's uh, in demand in the marketplace right mm -hmm. so um uh, uh for this kind of companies tech companies right um do you have any idea what kind of qualities or what kind of criteria are they looking out for in terms mm -hmm. of all these uh, employments okay I can't generalize for all tech companies uh, because even within tech companies itself, there's so many different yeah. companies. Each of them have their own unique set of uh, culture and the their own kind of like skill set that they are looking for. Um, so I, I can't answer this question on a very broad way, but hmm. maybe perhaps if I adjust this question a bit and frame it as yep, if sure. I'm a lender, I want to know what kind of skills I should get, uh, what hmm. kind of uh, maybe courses I should take, um, what kind of companies I should join? Um, then I would uh, I like to say that there's a very very useful research tool uh, at the disposal, uh, which is actually called LinkedIn. Uh. So when I'm during my younger days, I would go and not stalk uh, but like observe people's LinkedIn profiles. So if I want to be like them, then I observe their profiles. I look at the kind of um, courses they take, right? I look at the kind of companies they join. Um, I look at how long they stay. I look at the kind of roles they pick. And then from there, I try to identify like some patterns or common patterns between all the people that I look up to. Um, and then I try to follow them and uh, pick out trends that could be useful. So, so yeah. Mm, okay. So which means using LinkedIn to find role models. Yeah, right? correct. To, so that to, to follow kind of things that, oh, you know, uh, then you get closer to what probably some of their ideal employers will be looking out for. Yeah, correct, correct. Okay, okay, that's that's a good idea, right? Yeah. Uh, this is also a tool that is not available for our previous generation, right? Oh, yeah, they probably correct. have to, <laughs> they probably have to really network their way through to figure yes, things out. Yes. yes. Uh, so there are a lot more uh, ways for people to understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. On on the skills part, let's let's uh, also go in a bit deeper, right? Because mm -hmm. we know that there are some millennials probably they found themselves. Oh, you know, I graduated in this field. Uh, uh maybe uh. For example zoology or whatever right so uh, but then they're thinking of like going to uh, tech companies to work right then they mm -hmm. felt that you know i have like a uh, sort of like um wasted my time in the wrong degree or the wrong diploma um mm -hmm. how can i change is it too late should i get another second degree or should i uh, rescue myself or should i just forget all about joining the dream job that i want you know okay. what, what should that do right because maybe when they were younger they didn't uh, have a choice or maybe they took a wrong choice only after that they knew it right so what what are some of the remedy that they can do mm. okay okay so so you are a young person and you are in this kind of situation right please don't feel alone uh, a lot of people actually work in fields that they they did not um study study 
study. Like for example, uh, our dear friend from Mook Salary Man, he actually um, uh, graduated with a degree in like criminology or something. But now he's like running his own business and, and content page. So you don't have to actually do something that is directly related to your degree. Uh, similar for myself, I'm actually uh, a journalism student, but I didn't end up doing anything that is you know directly related to journalism as well. Um, so I hope that this gives you some form of encouragement that you don't necessarily have to you know, take your degree in a subject and it's not too late to actually make a, a change, huh? especially when you are still still young. Um, as for what you can do is basically, I think it really depends on what role you are aiming for, right? So let's say, for instance, you are actually aiming for, uh, like for myself, okay, I used to study journalism uh, and I wanted to go into business development. So for me, I look at these two roles and I try to look at what are the common similarities between these two roles. And I found that there's certain overlaps, right? So things like, uh, oh, okay, the ability to you know, be a good listener, right? And of course, the ability to present information that is you know, simplified, concise, and then goes, go, uh, hits, hits the new, uh, not say hit the new, like um, showcase the benefits and the, the main point very quickly. So these are two like overlapping skills that you know journalism and also business development has, uh, and I use these you know soft skills you know uh, to kind of like switch industries also, and so I encourage you to actually look at the industry you want to be in, and then look at where you are at now, and then find like what are the what are the common grounds, what are the overlaps, and then from there you will be able to plan your plan your entry properly. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it's almost a relook what your strengths are and whether you can leverage them to enter an industry uh, that probably requires some of these uh, qualities, right? Um, so for yourself, uh, uh, can I say where, which company you are working in? Okay. No, probably not. Hey, but sorry, I'm just looking <laughs> at the comments. Uh, and so sorry to uh, Muhammad Hadi and also Sin E and James. Um, you guys mentioned that my internet is not... Uh, working too well so sorry could i just check right if it's still the case if, um if so maybe i could just like change my location uh on and off la, on and off yeah on and, on and off, off yeah there, there are okay. some parts that will get patchy yeah. could you guys like comment and just let me know like how how it's been? like in the past five minutes was i like disconnected in in any way it wasn't disconnected but uh there were some stalls yeah Oh, okay, okay. So, what do you suggest we do? Should I move to a different location? Uh, take one minute. To uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I think, I think, I think, yeah, that would be great. Okay, yeah, so yeah. sorry, guys. Huh? Okay, just give me one minute. No worries, no worries. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, for those who are watching, um, we are at the topic of uh, millennial careers. Uh, and challenges that they face in this uh, era. Okay, so if you are a millennial, you are listening in. Uh, if you have all these uh, challenges, or you know what, some of the questions that you you want answered, uh, you can just put them in the comment box, and uh, I'll get Geraldine to answer. All right. So meanwhile, just give her a while uh, to let her go closer to the Wi-Fi so that the connection will be better. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Leon, for your feedback. Uh, so uh, she's she's trying to shift to a better location. I hope that that's uh, getting better. All right. Thank you for your patience. Actually, I don't know how many of you are millennials. Uh, you know, Doctor Wealth uh, audience. I uh, we we recently do some surveys, but uh, we haven't got a very good sense of who our demo what our demographics for our audience are. Uh, if you're a millennial, can you just uh, type in the comment box, I'm a millennial? Just type M, okay? So that at least I know whether millennials are listening or not. Yes, you're back. Hey guys, I just wanted to check you guys if the camera is a lot better now and can you guys hear me properly? If so, yes, I think. It. Yeah, yeah. I, it looks okay to me. I don't know about the rest. Okay, so if it's good, this type okay, then she knows she can just uh, stick to where she is. Yeah. No, I was just asking like how many of them are millennials. Yeah, ask them to, to type M if they're a millennial. Because right. I also don't know my Dr. Wealth audience. <laughs> are they younger or are they uh, more senior? Uh, so Liu, Liu is millennial. Yeah, I'll oh, guess right. so. Uh. Of course, right? Because I attended one of your courses last year. Yeah. I do see yeah. that you have a very good mix between um, people who are like of the older generation and also the younger ones. Also. So good job on that, Elvin. 
Okay, okay, yeah. Not, not, not within my control. <laughs> okay, thank you. Leon, Leon said it's much better. All right, so let's, let's continue. Okay, let's continue. Uh, uh, well, I was asking about, right, how do you get into your current job? You know, yeah. what, what makes you choose your current job? Of course, if you are not comfortable to share which company, I think it's fine, but maybe you give a little bit of detail how you end up in this job. Why do you choose, like, so many jobs? And uh, what, what are some of the things that you did that land you in this job? Because you mentioned that you were in journalism, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you joined a uh, uh, fast-growing industry, I would say, <laughs> right? So how do you land yourself in this kind of uh, job? Okay, um, maybe I'll, I'll talk about my current uh, uh, role um, and how I actually uh, got in. So basically, um, I'm actually working at a US MNC that um, is a CRM company. So that should give you an idea of <laughs> where I am. <laughs> so, um, and basically for this um, uh, company, it's not really easy to, to get in. Uh. So um, that's why I, it took me around five tries to actually uh, end up in my current role. That's why I really uh, treasure this job and um, this opportunity that I five have. Five tries? Yeah, five tries. As in, yeah. as in five applications? Five applications, correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, even with referral, I couldn't even get an interview. Uh. But then uh, what I did was that, um, you know, rather than just like apply and then have my resume end up in this black hole of <laughs> portal, you know, and flooded with all the other resumes. Uh, what yeah. I did was actually I went to hunt down who is the recruiter who is recruiting for wow. this position. And then Is it the internal recruiter or they hired the external one? Internal, internal recruiter. Internal, okay. yeah. So I actually wrote a, a LinkedIn message to him again and like, oh, hi, my name is Geraldine. I saw that, you know, this role is open, you know, could I just check if you are recruiting for this role? And if so, actually, I do have a lot to share about what I can bring to the table. Shall we schedule a call tomorrow this time? And this is my number. Yeah, so that's wow. basically basically it. And then from there, I managed to get an a interview. So, um, you know, speaking of this, right, uh, there's a lot of people sharing with me right now that, you know, they are applying, applying for jobs and everything, but they're actually not able to get a, a response. And this is very natural given that, you know, right now we have a lot more people looking for 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 jobs than before due to the economic situation. At, at the same time, there are not so many roles which are available as well. So therefore, I do encourage uh, you to also try this method. Like Rather than just apply on job portals, you can actually proactively look for the hiring manager or the recruiter and then reach out to them to, to engage them and to you know try to get yourself, um, try to cut, not say cut queue, but um, try to get yourself uh, noticed. Yeah, correct. <laughs> That's, that's a big tip, actually. I, I, I thought that was one that, you know, people can really apply it immediately. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I guess tomorrow, the HR managers will have a flood of uh, LinkedIn messages <laughs> in the inbox. <laughs> yeah. But I, I guess it's, it's what you're trying to share is that uh, there's a reality of uh, the job market right now because um, uh, the big companies or the good companies are getting a lot of applications, right? Mm. And yeah, have to compete with a lot of people and not just Singaporeans, right? The, mm. the people around the, the region or even the world. Um, and you have to do something different. Otherwise, uh, everybody's resume looks so impressive, right? Because mm. they're probably trained even by the school. You know, you should write this, write this, showcase this. Should, everybody is the same, right? So probably they just throw that, okay, let's interview this and interview that. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I think being proactive, like what you mentioned, uh, is, is important, right? Really going, uh, uh, not using the usual ways uh, will probably get you noticed. Uh, yeah. So maybe after a lot of people try LinkedIn, it's not working. Then we need a new hack. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then maybe networking will be the, the, the next thing to be do to do right. Okay. 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 Uh, Claire has a question. She said that I don't know what I am interested to do in my career for the next 40 years. Are there small and easy ways to find out what I'm good at and what I will be interested to do? Right. So I, I guess that was what you mentioned uh, just now as well. Uh, one of the common questions you always receive, right? what should I do with my life? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds like an existential question. Yeah. Hey, Claire. So if you are still uh, online, I just wanted to say that you, know, you are not alone because when I graduated, I also spent the first one and a half years trying to figure out, is this right for me? And there were a lot of times I was thinking, I, uh, maybe I'm not cut out for BD. Maybe I should go back to do like journalism, you know, maybe I, you know, I was just thinking like, you know, what am I doing with my 
life. So I totally understand that kind of uh, frustration because I've also been there. Um, so for, for, for me, what I recommend, right, is actually, you know, first of all, it starts with self-discovery, right? So you know, your, you know yourself first. Um, and there's a few ways to go about doing it. For me, doing personality tests were like super, super uh, helpful, right? Um, you know, things like uh, Big Five, um, DISC, uh, you know, and the various kind of strengths finder and all that. These are very, very useful tools that I, I've used to help me to understand my strengths and weaknesses. And if you are more spiritual, you may even consider like Pazi reading and all that because, you know, it, it apparently has worked for some people. So, you know, uh, it might work for, for, for you as well. Um, so these are some of the methods which I use to kind of um, understand a bit more about myself. And from there, I was, you know, by doing all these tests um, that I highlighted, uh, I was kind of able to narrow down like what are my strengths and weaknesses. Um, so that was the first thing I did to kind of um, learn more about, you know, what kind of career am I suited for? Um, the second thing that I did was actually tons of internship. So I really did like a lot of uh, part-time jobs, um, internships and all that. Because through experience, you kind of figure out like, oh, actually I don't like this kind of working environment. Oh, maybe I don't like this kind of uh, roles, right? And then from there, you can kind of eliminate yeah, and eventually find out like, um, you know, which is the correct field for you to, to enter. So um, it's also worth considering, right? what do you see a career as uh, and how it aligns in your life because there's two ways to look at it right some people it's like they want to do their they want to work for passion so it really has to be something that they are super interested in whereas for other people they could be more like okay a career is just a means for me to bring in income and to sustain the rest of my life which is more important to me like maybe family and all that so they may just choose based on money so so i also encourage you to have this kind of um self-reflection to understand what a career actually means to you yeah hmm. okay okay so um uh, personality tests and things like this right what, what if um there are conflicts like this personality test say that your strength is here then another personality test say that your strength is elsewhere uh, I, i'm not sure like, whether there will be such kind of scenarios but i'm just thinking <laughs> okay uh, what if there are some of this uh, conflicting? Because I also agree that it's not easy to even figure out, right? What you should you do? And yeah. I guess the biggest fear is people do not want to make a choice now that they will regret 10 years, three yeah. years later, right? So I guess uh, that's what they're in the flux. Yeah. And then yeah. they get these sources, then they get very conflicting mm-hmm. ideas. Then maybe they're going to talk to their mother, talk to their friend, and all give very conflicting ideas, right? Correct, correct. <laughs> So I, I think that, um, yeah, of course, you are, you are not wrong to say that some personality tests give um, uh, conflicting answers. After all, there's no, I wouldn't say that there's a personality test in this world that is 100% uh, accurate because even for ourselves, it is something that is constantly evolving. So like Alvin, yourself, I'm sure you are a very different person five years ago versus today, right? You I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do a test recently, but I did a test five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably evolved in some ways, changed in some ways. Yeah, it's part of a human to to grow. Um, so of course, other than personal tests, you can also, you may also wish to consider you know talking to to friends, uh, close friends, talking to mentors, talking to superiors at work, just to find out like what is your strengths. And the, the key thing is really to have to be honest with yourself about where your limitations are and where your natural inclinations are, are at so that you can actually use this information to take the path of least resistance if, if advancement is actually your, your goal. Yeah. I, I mean, I also used to like, uh, I can't remember when, uh, maybe more than 10 years ago, I like, started to do like personality tests, really to really understand myself as well. Uh, uh, just that I didn't manage to like figure out uh, what am I supposed to do. <laughs> Uh, but, but I did find that oh, so many personality tests, if it's useful, some of you who are listening in, I think that the big five, I find that it's the uh, most useful right, compared mm-hmm. to a lot of other tests. Uh. So yeah, uh, no harm trying, right? You never know what you, you can find about yourself. Yeah. Okay, great. I uh, also don't know whether Claire is working or not or whether still in internship. Uh, but I, I guess the another tip is that, as you said, uh, just go and try more jobs. And uh, it's a... It's a it, choice by elimination right it's like multiple yeah. choice you don't know what is the right answer but you know what is the wrong answer right then you eliminate until you cannot eliminate oh that's the passion that's <laughs> that's the <laughs> career that's supposed to be in okay so okay let's let's maybe move on beyond millennials all right uh let's let's talk about 
the COVID situation and uh, uh, you mentioned that you also read the DBS report, right? So mm. there it seems like there is a rising uh, trend that more people are suffering pay cuts. Right? Mm. According to the DBS report, it's like uh, as of May, 26% of the people have suffered more than 10% pay cut. That's among DBS clients, but DBS, you know, has a lot of clients. So probably it's quite representative representative of the entire Singapore. So uh, we don't know whether numbers will go up in June, July, August, right? So um, uh, there will be challenges that uh, people will be suffering from pay cuts and things like this. Do you have any idea if anyone in the audience are suffering from all these uh, pay cuts, what can they do? Mm. Okay, so if you are actually suffering from you know, in a, you're actually in a very unfortunate situation whereby your, your pay is being deducted. I think the first thing you have to look at is, of course, to look at your current lifestyle and to see, you know, cut out whatever needs to be um, eliminated. Let's say, for instance, you, you may not want to um, always order food delivery, but rather actually buying from coffee shops and all that. Or perhaps maybe you have to take, make some sacrifices that like go out, you know, slightly less or so. Um, on top of that, beyond just you know savings, right? Because there's a limit to how much you can save. If you have some free time, it's also worth to explore. Like, okay, what are some alternative sources of income that you know you can pick up? So, for instance, for me, starting of April, I've been focusing a lot on my blog and trying to you know do some affiliate marketing to generate uh, income from it. I even did a paid ad recently as well. So, these are some alternative things you can look at. You you may not be a blogging kind of person, but perhaps maybe you have other you know, very, very uh, niche set of skills. Like maybe you are very good in giving tuition or maybe very good in taking pictures and all those. These are also skills that you can monetize you know, and create a side hustle for, your, um, for yourself. So I think that this is the two, two, two immediate steps that you know, I would take if I was actually in that kind of um, situation mm -hmm. whereby my you know, income has been um, unfortunately uh, affected because of the COVID-19 situation. Mm -hmm. So side gigs, huh? side hustles. Mm -hmm. Right, especially relevant in a gig economy where there are a lot of platforms that you can monetize your skill set okay. right, or your interest or your passion, right? Mm. Okay, that's, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, uh, do you have stories like this where, uh, or have you met anybody who has suffered pay cuts mm. so far? Uh, I wouldn't say pay cut per se, but I have met a few people who have lost their jobs. And, and what mm. I really admire about um, some of them is that they were not, you know, although maybe perhaps they were from very high positions in, in the past, mm. they were mm. not afraid to kind of like, you know, do what is needed to sustain their families. For instance, maybe take up some food delivery jobs and, and all that, which, you know, I think that this is something that really deserves um, um, respect, yeah, you know, for, you know, the kind of love and commitment that they have to their family that it kind of outweighs their maybe personal um pride and, and also I, I really look up to to some of them and what they have done as well yeah okay yeah, because uh so far uh around my circle of friends uh, i have not seen anyone that like uh, pick i don't know like, retrenchment definitely there wasn't any so um i i don't know whether that is also what most people in the audience also experience right uh and then I don't know whether it paints a very false picture that, you know, everything is fine, you know, COVID-19 didn't really create a lot of problems, right? The, the malls are still very crowded. The, the, sometimes the traffic is going to have a jam, right, in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thing. So it seems like, yeah, it's just the probably only inconvenience is you need to scan in and you wear a mask. Other than that, everything is well and good, right? So um, I, I, I don't know, which, which side are you on? Do you think that uh, we are heading to worse times or we are heading to better times? Alvin, most of your friends from your army days, is it? That's why. <laughs> no, 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 no. They are in variety of uh, um, industry. Yeah. Okay, okay. Even yeah. The, the, you know, the surprising thing is that uh, uh, real estate agency, right? You know, property, yeah. um, I, would th I would have thought that, you know, probably people would not want to buy houses mm. at this point in time. But what I heard is that they are very busy. They are making a lot of money. <laughs> Right. Oh, okay, so, okay. Yeah, so, so they are they're very counterintuitive. So when 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 you look at news, it's very pessimistic. But when you mm -hmm. look around, uh, uh, your friends and family and relatives, right, it isn't that bad after all. So I don't know whether which which kind of lens, uh, should we be using, which is closer to the truth, mm -hmm. right? So that that is something that is always like, uh, uh 
torturing me since March after COVID nineteen has struck. Right, that there is a lot of misleading kind of uh, indicators or kind of situation. Yeah. Okay. Generally, I think we we hang out with people who are of similar profiles. Huh? So, um, probably it, for example, I'm in, in tech industry, right? I yeah. also hang out with people who, who work in a similar industry or maybe come from a similar background, and hence I don't see uh, too many people being um, retrenched or being having their pay cut within my work circle. But of course, I'm also a volunteer. So when I volunteer, I also look at get a chance to interact with other segments of society who work in other industries like f and uh, hospitality, or you know, maybe smaller SMEs, right, who, who could be more um, affected by these trends as well. So I think sometimes we have to step outside, outside of our kind of circle in order to see the reality. Um, mm. As an individual, I trust data. So I will always look at you know, reports, uh, data, and I think the DBS data uh, survey is definitely worth paying attention to given that you know they have so many customer and yeah. probably a lot of people use dbs and um you know they i don't i don't i would i would really put a lot of um you know i really think that data is pretty accurate yeah okay okay yeah so um uh, if you guys uh, uh one what which report we are referring to right uh, we actually dr will actually publish a post today to summarize all the findings you can go and find the full report uh, we linked it in the post itself and uh the, I, I guess your point was right that uh, our our people in our circle are biased sample right mm. it's not reflective of the entire population and uh, probably we are in a more privileged position that's why we don't mm. see a lot of all these retrenchment and pay cuts and things like this right uh, but it doesn't mean that there are some people out there uh, that are also like us, right? They probably could have been a lot worse. And what the DBS report was surfacing was that the worst group was uh, about 35 to 44, so it's a bit middle age, right? And uh, they are low salary, like low income, that means less than 2,999, and uh, they have less than one month of savings, right? So these people receive pay cuts, they're already very low, link, uh, low income, they get pay cuts, and then now they are in a sandwich generation where they probably need to take care of the young and as well as the old, and yet they only have one month of uh, savings, right? So I guess um, uh, indeed this, uh, I don't know, sandwich generation is, uh, is a true problem, right? Um, do you have any advice to help this group of people? Mm, all right. I see. So I think that your question is really more about how we can support this group of uh, lower yeah, income. It could, be, it could be support or whichever, right? Because I, I guess they, they already started with low income. So even if they want to save more, they can't. So their, their emergency savings is always very low, right? And now mm -hmm. when this kind of event struck, that's where they hit them the hardest and they receive a pay cut, even though they, they are taking very low income already. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I guess they are the most vulnerable group, right? Mm, yeah, correct. In the short term, of course, I think that you know things like donation uh, really helps. For example, I donate to donated to Beyond Social Services during this period of time mm. uh, to actually um, help them to support the, their beneficiaries who are who tend to be from lower income families with some of their basic needs. Uh, and all of course, donating is a really short term solution. But in the longer term, we also have to help them to catch up. You know, because a lot of them um, maybe because of the circumstances they are in, they are not too tax savvy, right? And if you're not tax savvy, you miss out on a lot of opportunities, like you know how to use LinkedIn properly, how to um, you know how to even apply for a job on a job portal, right? These are things that you you may not um, know about. So I think that we have to help to help this group of people to catch up um, with the rest of society, so that they too can enjoy the benefits of you know um, this of what this digital um, you know push in our society has has brought us. Uh, I'll share with you a story eh, because uh, I was actually helping my elderly resident apply for a driver job um, online. And um, it, it does seem that you know he, he had a lot of problems to use the portal because first of all, uh, something like an email would be required to actually set up you know, an account to apply, right? But for him, he, he couldn't even remember his email address or, and all that. And I had to kind of look at his phone to, to identify, like, okay, this is your email, this is your email address because a lot of them mainly use... Um, WhatsApp to, to apply for, for jobs or so. Um, and at the same time, somehow for that portal, you have to kind of uh, upload a resume, right? But then again, like for a driver's job, I, 
I wouldn't think that you know for the job specifically that we were applying for, you would actually you wouldn't actually need a resume. What you need is probably more like okay, maybe you have a license and stuff like that. So I, I do hope also that at the same time, while while we help to upskill this group of people, some of these technology providers like you know job portal and all can try to make their platforms a little bit more inclusive, um, such that you know these people can also enjoy the benefits of the platform also. Mm. Or, or maybe the employers, right, could have choose a better channel than to reach out. I, I yeah, don't know. <laughs> correct. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they have to upload resume. I agree with you, right? It doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Mm. Probably, you know, if a license, no criminal record, no no uh, accidents, I, I guess that's more about it. Right? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, how, how, how old was he? Uh, I think he was. I, I, I didn't ask his age, <laughs> but okay. we'll just estimate, right? Probably estimate, 60, yeah. uh, 60. 60, okay. So he's yeah. really more like elderly, right? Correct, because right. I, always, I always believe that the sandwich generation is somewhere around the 30s, 40s now, right? Yeah. So mm. uh, that's where their kids are young. They need to take care of them and then they need mm. to take care of their aged parents. Mm. And they are also usually they don't have a lot of siblings because the, the previous generation or the parents' generation may not have so many kids, right? Every yeah, generation yeah. is getting fewer, fewer. So that creates a lot of burden on this group of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we mentioned that the, the what Beyond Social Service uh, mm. organization do look after all this uh, uh, low-income family. Uh, family all right, mm. all right. Okay, okay. Yeah. Is there a specific one for sandwich generation? Because they may not be, they may not be low income, right? But they may be like earning, uh, say, comfortable, uh, four five thousand dollars, but mm. it's not enough to support so many mouths, right? Maybe mm. they have six, seven dependents. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, specific organization that supports sandwich generation. That one I'm not too, not too sure actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, probably it doesn't exist, lah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think you may want to establish one too. Uh, no la, no la, no la. Okay. <laughs> too busy already. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so Leon also mentioned that uh, his parents is in their 60s and can only use very basic tech we have today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, I, my, my mother-in-law is also that someone uh, uh, who doesn't really know technology, but uh, I guess they all could use the phone, the, the mm -hmm. smartphones nowadays, right? Which is a godsend, right? So they can mm -hmm. WhatsApp, send photo, watch video, they can do that. Uh, but not beyond that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my wife was just telling uh, my mother-in-law, so, you know, there is a, there's a free course for, for elders to learn about technology in community centers, right? It's free. You just go and learn and maybe make some friends. Then my mother-in-law was very resist. Uh, resistive towards that idea no no no, no, no don't need no, no, i don't need to learn all these things so sometimes it's not that uh there are no help right but the individual may not be receptive to the idea right mm -hmm. so uh, uh i i don't know do you have any good ways that i can convince my mother in law to <laughs> take the course and be more savvy in tech I don't believe that something would be um something's very powerful no matter what age we are at and there's a peer influence so okay. if you have a group of uh, auntie friends uh, yeah. who are more, you know, um, perhaps maybe not so afraid of technology, you could get them to like encourage each other to uh, go I together for, for these courses. Uh, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. So it cannot come from us. Lah. We have to influence yeah, yeah. the friends and the friends influence. Uh. Okay, okay, yeah, good right, point. Right. Okay, I'll try that. I'll try that. Okay, and um Recently, I also read the news that uh, you know, the the central bank was uh, put, MAS right was putting out the the news and say that encourage banks to hire more Singaporeans right. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, a lot of banks came back with like, oh no, most of our employees are like Singaporeans, etc. Um, I I don't know. Do you have any uh, uh insight? Is this uh you know that is this a mosity towards foreign? Uh, employees working in Singapore, taking away jobs from Singaporeans. Um, do you think in general this is true? Mm, okay, I cannot comment for the finance industry because I, I, I don't yeah. work there and I wouldn't say my knowledge of the industry is a, a lot in um, you know something that's very, very um, detailed. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, maybe I can just start off by, of course, first uh, you know, sharing my appreciation for many of these um, foreign PMETs who have come here to kind of like, you know, share their knowledge and also do their part to support our economy. And, I, and I'm very, very aware that, you know, there are some circumstances where there's truly a lack of uh, people with a certain kind of skills. 
and that's why we do need all these uh, some of these workers to come in to help and some of them actually are very generous with sharing their knowledge and you know helping locals and all at the same time um, you know i also feel quite saddened right to see many of us um, singaporean workers being discriminated in, in a country that we call home yeah and this is especially so during challenging times like now um, you know there was this recent report whereby 47 more employees were being added to this mom watch this for um, suspected discriminatory hiring practices against Singaporean, and you know it, it's just it's just kind of appalling for me and because you know I, I can't think of any other country <laughs> in this world whereby the locals are, are being discriminated against and there's even laws that are being set up to kind of rectify this problem because this problem should not even happen in the first place um, and you know sometimes I I, I do hear uh, and also observe that you know when a certain kind of um, a certain, um, um, you know, person of certain background is in a, a department. He tends, tends, he or she tends to hire people of similar background as well, and you know that actually causes uh, some of the um, workers to to lose out on these opportunities. So while I do appreciate and recognize the need for you know more foreign PMEP to come here, <coughs> the need, you know, I do recognize and acknowledge that there's a need for foreign PMEPs. I do hope that there could be some stricter guidelines to protect us locals like for example maybe when you know applying uh, for ep um you know firms don't just um have to like post on my career future for 14 days but maybe perhaps could could actually be required to um, do a little bit more paper work like to justify like you know the um more reasons as to why um you know they what they need and what are the efforts that they have taken so far who are these singaporean candidates who apply why are they not suitable and, and things like that such that we can actually um, create a more uh, level playing field for for singaporeans okay so so you're suggesting that uh, employers who hired uh, foreigners to to produce this kind of report uh, really say mm. that oh i tried you know uh, these are some of the challenges i cannot find that's why we have ended up with a uh, application for ep mm -hmm. correct okay. Yeah, okay so uh which means you're saying that uh, sometimes it's the employers that are that are abusing it lah, right not so much of the the uh, guidelines or whatever that's out there mm, yeah no because right now the current current uh i would say rule to apply for yeah. my career future uh, to apply for uh, ep is just like oh i need to put on my career future for 14 days then uh -huh. uh, for those that are paying below 20k and then after this 14 days um then uh, we can actually apply for EP. But then sometimes I, I do hear of, um, I, I do see a possibility for firms to just like, okay, I choose the candidate. Again. Then I just put the advertisement for 14 right. days. Then after that, I, I hire the candidate that I want. So they're the, skirting, skirting the rules. Uh, right? Yeah, correct, correct. Okay, okay, okay. So which means there should also be more stringent ways to, to prevent them from uh, taking this kind of uh, uh, shortcut, la, overcoming the rules in certain ways. No? Yep, correct. Okay, okay, right. Um, uh, just now, I, 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 I don't know whether uh, you agree with me, the most vulnerable group is that uh, the 35 to 44, the sandwich class, you know, with uh, very little savings, etc. Um, I, I know you do a lot of volunteer work. Um, mm. Do you, do you, what other, some, some other vulnerable groups do you, do you see in Singapore? Okay, I, I wouldn't say that there's a such uh, a most vulnerable group because um, back to our first topic, right? I think every generation has their own set of challenges. Yeah. Uh. So let me start by uh, talking about the sandwich generation. Yeah, indeed, uh, they are in a very uh, unfortunate circumstances. And I just imagine myself if I have uh, elderly parents uh, to look after who might be unwell, and I also have children to look after. And, and I, at the same time, maybe my income is being impacted. I think it's a very, very stressful situation for anyone to be in. Um, and I do hope that this doesn't happen to, to more people. Um, at the same time, for graduates, they, they also don't have it uh, easy as well. I mean, you know, think about like, you know, you, are, you study so hard for the past few years and then you start off your career in a... At this time. A, yeah, at this time, yeah. And many of these graduates, they, they could also be facing their own set of challenges, like maybe their parents lose their job, so it becomes on them you know, to be the sole breadwinner to, to support the whole family. So we cannot assume that, um, of course, 
uh, a certain generation, a certain segment of people would have it easier than the other. I think everybody's yeah. situation is um, equally, um, you know, um, severe and also um, unique in its own ways. Huh? Uh, at the same time, we also have elderly because, you know, yeah. I think that right now, um, for example, I'm an elderly cleaner, right? I do believe that, you know, there could be things like uh, being, I'm being told to work uh, maybe three, three or four days uh, per week instead of six days. And that actually impacts my my income as well. So these are the blue collar workers that we also have to pay attention to, especially when they are old and they 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 are earning on an hourly basis. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I guess uh, you're right in the sense that each group has their own challenges now, and it's mm. not one is uh, worse or one is better than the others, mm. right? Uh, uh, I guess maybe we should be more uh, empathetic, right? So for for some of us who are in more privileged position, uh, if we really see someone in need, I think we should extend our helping hand as much as possible, right? Yeah, maybe giving tips to cleaner makes sense now, right? Especially during this period, I think it's getting tougher. So um, because I do know that people, uh, the funny thing is that there are a lot more investors during this COVID-19, right? And the stock market has been doing well, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's also at the same time, the privileged people are the ones who are able to invest because they have capital, mm -hmm. right? So I, I guess this COVID-19 sort of like uh, expanded the rich poor gap as well, right? Mm -hmm. That really push it more towards extreme end. It's, I, I think it's not good for society. Yeah. So uh, I'm a believer that we should, we should help the less fortunate. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it's about time. It's an uh, hour past uh, our, since our conversation started. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's good to call it a day. Okay. And really, thank you. I, I hope that you could have given more tips uh, if you have more time. But I guess uh, we need to respect your time as well since we agree that no, we should just do one hour. And uh, anyway, uh, Geraldine has a blog, right? It's a name, okay? And then you just go and uh, look at for a lot of the tips that she has uh, written and also a lot of her stories, right? How she saved that $100,000 by a young age. So a lot of inspiring things that she has done, okay? So uh, thank you for coming to the show and thank you for sharing a lot of big tips. Uh, I particularly like the e uh, LinkedIn message, the HR manager. <laughs> that was a great one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Alvin, for having me and to the audience who's watching. Uh, thank you very much for, for bearing with me as I switch locations just now. And also apologies once again for the um, technical issues that I had on my end. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to just DM me on Instagram if you have Instagram. Or you can also just drop me an a email. Um, and I think that you know I'll be able to try to address your questions from, from there. But thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Right. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night.